we've gone in quick, haven't we? Gone quick into the, all the <laughs> no build up here. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the EdTech Podcast, where we seek to improve the dialogue between Ed and Tech for better innovation and impact. My name is Sophie Bailey, and you are very welcome. Before we kick off with this week's episode, here's a quick message from Stefan Kasper, who wrote our latest guest blog titled Teaching Through the Pandemic, A Brit's View from the US. Hi, Sophie. I hope that everyone is well. I'm sending my best wishes from across the pond and thank you for the opportunity to reflect on these past months of teaching amid the pandemic and Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George Floyd. I've been living in the States for the past couple of years and moved here with my little family, teaching at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. It's been tough. It's been a challenging time for all of us. But writing this piece, I've been struck by the way our community of teaching and learning has rallied and supported each other, from simple words of encouragement to sharing resources, guest spots and more. So thank you, everyone. I'm teaching throughout the summer and preparing for a hybrid of face-to-face and online delivery. Uh, This week, American universities were told that international students would have to return home or face deportation if their programs are fully online. Uh, The pressure is on us to teach face-to-face with no consideration to whether learning can actually take place in socially distanced classrooms. The protests continue, and we haven't been happy with the leadership shown by the universities, and we know that we can all do more to tackle the awful inequalities that exist for black students and people of colour. I hope that we can talk again soon. I want to reassure you, though, that we've been well looked after in Pennsylvania, uh, even as COVID cases have risen. It looks like we'll cycle in and out of lockdown for some time. So take care, everyone. Stay safe. Wear a mask when you go out and look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks, Stefan. And if you want to read Stefan's post, go to the edtechpodcast.com forward slash blog. And if you want to write for our guest blog, get in touch at the edtechpodcast at gmail.com. Now, this week's episode is all about home learning. We're in conversation with head teachers, teachers, digital leads, edtech demonstrator program leads, editors and edtech companies, taking stock of the past week's experiences in the UK and how we might prepare and improve as the autumn term approaches, with local lockdowns also looming. To set us up for this week's episode, I wanted to find out a bit more about which edtech was popular in the early days of lockdown. What have people been searching for during this time and why? So I spoke to Michael Forshaw from EdTech Impact, a global edtech review platform, to see what's been trending. Here's what Michael had to say. So we positioned EdTech Impact very early on as a definitive place to help schools uh, understand what different offers were available and um, really going quite granular on on the filters so not just is there a COVID offer what are they doing but actually uh, can it be downloaded offline is it available to parents does it require parental engagement how long does free actually mean is it a seven day trial is it is it 30 days is it for the duration of lockdown is it free until the summer we've seen quite a range so we create a number of filters to allow you to uh, break that down and that's really what we're trying to do uh, for the sector is to, is to build uh, more feedback and build more transparency really around what schools think across different demographics so we did a, a short list of the best products recently on, on linkedin and the top 10 if we take just those um it was pro- companies and products that are focusing on the core subjects so english maths science um, when we when we look analyze a little bit deeper, we could see that all of them were quite well established companies as well. So at least four years old. Some of them going beyond ten years. Um, they all seem to do one thing well, um, all supporting generally independent learning. Um, and it was also quite what what we found quite interesting is it's been well documented how the ed tech industry has stepped up and really. Uh, made their, their access to their products as free uh, as possible but and so uh, the question is like should you make your product free to, to support schools now and actually looking at these top 10 um, majority of them didn't um, 
lot of them held quite firm. In terms of the top three, can you give us a, can you share with us which are the sort of top three most viewed companies? So the top one was a company called Pobble. They had a two week trial. Uh, I know they've been doing lots of uh, free resources on the side. A lot of them downloadable offline. Uh, Night Zookeeper was another one. Two, both those two are focused on, on literacy, sports and sparks maths. Now remember, EdTech Impact is a review site, not a download metric site. But no huge surprises there. I wonder, how does this stack up with our guest conversation? Well, one thing, the need for better data and feedback is something which comes up as urgently needed. So, a bit of background to this episode. The hashtag Home Learning UK popped up in the early days of the lockdown dreamt up on a Sunday evening and specifically rallied against the idea of homeschooling as, quote, parents aren't teachers and homes aren't schools. Katie Potts, a guest on this week's episode and the Robin Hood Trust of schools, worked together to uh, pool resources and the Robin Hood Trust prepared all the weekly home learning packs, which thousands of schools then went on to use as a template. Um, So check out the Home Learning UK hashtag uh, for more on that background. But specifically in this episode, you'll hear about how to make the most of live online sessions to clarify a work set, do group activities together and to allow children to socialise, how to break down information on learning to be used by parents and students and not professional teachers or supply teachers, for example, how to think about engagement and how it's influenced by factors like the weather, how a national approach, in this case Wales, differs to local or multi-academy trust approaches, some truth bombs from Caroline Keep, uh, low-tech and no-tech, for example, and we have to get her on the podcast soon, absolutely, changing the narrative around catching up and why catching up is not always necessary, as we might think, Um, And thinking longer term, why homeschooling can't just be about uploading PDFs if it happens again. And finally, why homeschooling sometimes is better off actually delivered in the school environment, which might be contrary to what we would normally think. But if you listen in, you'll find out more about why that is. So a huge shout out to Nick Ponsford, the regional lead for the EdTech Demonstrator Schools and co-founder for the GEC for hosting this week's chat and for all the other guests I've left in a doorbell ring and Nick's secret track at the end of the episode for good measure. If you like this episode, then please drop us a rate or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you're interested in advertising, contact us at theedtechpodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, have a fantastic week and stay safe, everyone. Bye bye. Okay, here we go. Hi, my name's Nick Ponsford and I am standing in for the wonderful Sophie Bailey as she is doing the incredibly important job of helping a little human out this morning. Um, I am the South West uh, Regional Lead for the EdTech Demonstrator Schools and Colleges Programme and uh, my side hustle, I am the co-CEO and founder of the GEC, the Gender Equality Collective, a startup with GEC app about to launch in autumn for um, schools and businesses. I am thrilled today to be joined by some incredible people, some I know and some it's the first time I've met them. Um, And we are going to be talking about really sort of the wins, the gaps uh, and our experiences around COVID-19. We have people joining um, at different parts of the session, which is uh, quite exciting. So um, we will kick off now and you might have some new voices coming. So um, we'll just go around. So Tom, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Tom Hooper. I've worked in EdTech for the last 11 years. So seven years ago, I founded a business called Third Space Learning. Um, And what we do is we provide online one-to-one maths programs for children in primary schools. Um, Most most often, these are children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And, And the model we've built is one which allows us to recruit STEM graduates from uh, across the world, notably India and Sri Lanka. 
with the aim of being able to provide um, high scale, high quality, but low cost one to one to help children in need. Um, and and kind of overwhelmingly, that's the audience we've reached. So about 70,000 children have now completed our one to one programs, of which 55 percent um can qualify for free school meals which is the, the metric we use to ensure that we are reaching the, the, the kind of social cohort that we aim to help um we just focus on maths at, at primary level um but we're now starting to look at, at secondary and, and some international markets as well awesome thanks tom and i yeah i really want to get into the digital divide and what's going on um so it'll be really interesting to hear what your experience is with that. Uh, Jenna, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. So my name is Jenna Ash, the editor of Education Technology, which is a free subscription only monthly magazine featuring all the latest ed tech news, opinion, information on events uh, covering the entire education sector. And we're part of Edquarter, which is a cross education learning platform for the schools and higher education sector. Thank you. And um, Paul? Oh, hi there. Um, yeah, so I'm assistant head teacher at Hanover Primary School uh, in Islington. Uh, we're a one and a half form entry school and um, I've coordinated the home learning uh, during this time. Uh, I've got previous, previous experience of setting up Google Classroom and making it work for a uh, non-COVID context. And uh, luckily I was sort of here and we were set up ready to go really because we were donated some Chromebooks and uh, although we hadn't used Google Classroom we had all the foundations in place to get it set up and, and going so we got a, got it coordinated pretty early and then had to obviously train staff and, and then use that as our primary platform for delivering home learning during this time. Awesome, awesome stuff and Pip? Yeah so um, I'm the computing lead at King's Cross Academy and much like Paul was saying um, was I had the role of trying to organize like the home learning plus so everything that we've been doing since lockdown and how children are accessing all of the learning and how we've sort of developed it and moved it forward since the start of lockdown really and sorting out what we're going to do in the future as well at the moment which is pretty interesting thank you so the, the, this is that was a quick round of everyone we've got at the moment i know we've all got an awful lot of stories that we could bring in and um, i'm sure everyone else here will be trying to filter what on earth they talk about first um i mean for me i was fortunate i've been part of um home learning uk i did a uh, project for a month helping organize video content for early years practitioners and homes um because i felt there wasn't much early years stuff out there so we did some i'm about to gift all that to family which is a big early years um at the network um and then since then um i have done a lot of work obviously with um we're in week 11 of the edtech demonstrator program here in the uk where we're matching schools and colleges um who are a little bit further on in their journey with those settings that need help and need and um, across the country. So that's been really illuminating to me. Um, and I think here we've got a broad set of people who've, who've done lots of different things. So I think what we'll do, we'll, we'll go with kind of like a leadership angle to start with. Um, and I just wondered uh, what kind of questions are constantly on your mind um, around this, would you say? Um, and, and kind of what's the best leadership advice that, that you've had Um I'll come first. Uh, Paul, can I start off with you? And then everyone feel free to chip in. It was it was starting small, really. Um, we, uh, for this context, we had to get in early. We knew pretty much straight away that this wasn't going to be a short-term thing. So we got in straight away and decided to start small in terms of making sure that um, we could connect the children through engaging videos, get that connection going straight away, and then make sure, obviously, all the teaching staff were... Um, confident enough in in delivering something which was going to be uh, useful and able to provide something um, for the children during this time. But I mean, it's been a really sort of an interesting experience from the start. Like I say, we got things going before the Easter holidays, and um, what we heard from other other schools was that they delayed and delayed and delayed, whereas we got things moving quickly and got the staff trained quickly. Um, and we've been able to provide um, a strategic sort of uh, um, platform where we're not overwhelming students with, uh, with, with tasks or assignments. Because, of course, the context which we're dealing with are so diverse. We've got 
huge differences in terms of the the demographic that we are providing for. We've got um, affluence meets poverty. So, so it was. It had been very easy to sort of overwhelm the children with um, uh, content because uh, and, and and provide something for those children who have all the device and support at home, but. For those that don't, um, it, it would have been very easy to lose them. So we had to start very small and then build up. Um, and now we've got 96% children accessing it. It has dropped off. Um, so we've had to, to manage coordination, the communication between those vulnerable families. But now it's thinking, well, we've got this incredible foundation uh, for this home learning platform. How can we use it to uh, initiate a blended learning platform, a flipped mm. classroom model, where um, we are... We, we're not sort of reliant upon, you know, the ego of the teacher being the person who can be the imparter of knowledge. Can we think about cognition? Can we think about learning and how it happens and, and use this as a tool to move forward? So I, I don't know if that answers your question in terms of leadership, but it's, it's, it's been a very interesting process. And now we're thinking, well, what next? Absolutely. And I think what you're saying as well is what I've seen, that there's, and I like it because we, we've gone in quick, haven't we? Gone quick into the, all the <laughs> no build up here. But we, um, I've seen as well that settings are going from a kind of a, the emergency response first of all to them thinking about, particularly with September coming, uh, with a back the backlash of oh, in September everything's going to be back to normal. To actually, we had the Leicester lockdowns, and everyone sort of realised that actually any minute things can change. And the legislation that came out in. Um, on Friday as well about the guidance um so yeah so I think those ideas around sort of starting simple and and looking at at you know you can't teach you can't reach which I remember Kaz Keep said quite early on in the day about it Tom it might be interesting to pass over to you with the work that you're doing around disadvantaged um families and students as well so what sort of advice have you got around leadership decisions at this point oh crikey I mean it's it's I suppose much of my Oh, no, my entire experience has been about trying to lead a business through this. The, the challenge that, that, that teachers and, and senior leaders in schools have faced is one that I, I can't begin to fathom how they've, they've dealt with this. I mean, it's, it's ridiculously hard. Mm-hmm. Um, so we worked with, I think it was a bit over 6,000 pupils each week, so providing live one-to-one sessions from our tutors in India and Sri Lanka to, to pupils in about 650 schools across the UK. I think we had about 45% of those pupils receiving their sessions from home. So we worked really closely with the kind of SLT and what we call the lead teacher in the school to try and make sure that our communications to the parents, either via the school or direct, would would kind of help facilitate that and then kind of repurpose our customer service to make sure that we could support parents and children directly in the home environment um so kind of given everything that was happening you know we were we were really pleased with that and kind of in addition we had um a huge number of families sign up to our maths hub where we have thousands of maths resources and um and kind of teacher cpd resources as well both parents searching directly for help and our schools saying to their families look for additional help, you can find lots of worksheets, Fluent in Five, you know, the, the CPD resources, etc., to help you. Um, just go to thirdspacelearning.com. So the kind of we were able to amplify our reach quite significantly. Then the big challenge we faced, um, at, you know, that the, we spoke to our schools about, and that was quite hard to overcome, certainly mm. in the short term, was that because we very specifically aim at helping children from largely disadvantaged backgrounds often there are challenges with infrastructure at home. So they might mm. not have computers. They might not have good bandwidth. They just might not have the environment to allow them to, to learn effectively online. Yeah, it was also um, just that setting up of a family as well. Just when yeah. there's, I mean, I've got three kids at home. It's not so easy to sit one child down with a piece of peace and quiet and have that focus, particularly if you're working as mm. well. Um, yeah that you know it, it it is a tough call and I know today there's been um some parent reports about how frustrated and and and, and how exasperated a lot of parents are with the you know that you will now educate your children it's been difficult yeah. for them, let alone those who have barriers against education 
and yeah. power is against devices as well. Absolutely. Well, and this is kind of the, the, the when we set up those based learning, the reason why we built a, a tutoring model specifically aimed at schools, and, and I think we're one of the, the few tutoring businesses that are aimed at schools rather than the more lucrative family market, um, was because we knew that to reach the children who needed that help the most, the, the, the most effective way of doing that was to do it under the kind of guardianship and within the environment of schools where teachers could direct the tutoring to target learning gaps and could ensure the infrastructure and, and, and the environment was, was best set up to help those children. And, and, um, and hence, we've been able to, to reach that, that audience. But yeah, undoubtedly, it's been a challenge for us and the, the schools we work with to make sure that that's translated effectively um, into the homes. So I think we were, you know, we were really pleased that kind of as many as 45% of the six plus thousand children were able to access it at home, but, but, you know, we want all of them to be able to access it. So mm -hmm. some of the things we're talking to schools about talking about as a business and indeed talking to kind of other organizations within the education um, sector is, is things like how could we actually provide some of the equipment directly to schools or directly to families that ensure those children have um, can access their learning and can do it in a way that is really easy and conducive um, to to success um, and you know we're, we we as, an, as a sector are really going to have to look at that because um, if if this carried on, if this happened again, if we had to go through continuous interruption, um, it cannot be the case that the, the kind of that divide is amplified by the, the setup and support that children have or, or, more, or more importantly, do not have at home. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to have to act pretty quickly mm. um, to make sure that, that that is not the barrier that it is today um, and indeed always has been historically but, but hasn't been um, uh, you know the light hasn't been shone on that as clearly as it is right now absolutely and I think a lot of the issues that um, that we're experiencing now were there pre-covid when it came to education when it came to capacity when it came to CPD um, dispositions towards yeah. tech the divide we had anyway my hope is as big learners um i'm really pleased that katie potts and becky bowler have joined us as well so we'll be talking to them in just a moment but i'd like to go over to pip for your experience of this in your setting i think when it came to starting it like the most important thing for us was the confidence of staff so how the staff needed to be trained because i think through seeing engagement sort of drop and dwindle in specific year groups over this time i think it's also come down to how confident staff are feeling about changing their approach and the sort of things that they're giving, what the sort of activities they're giving for the children. So that's like been a major thing for us. And I think at the beginning, it's really hard because you obviously want everyone to be trained and you've got a new system, like all you were saying about setting up Google Classroom and you want to roll that out and you're excited about it in a way. But um, I found uh, that the process of actually thinking but how is this going to be used for longer term and talking to staff and like trying to train them through the way is just really important. Also, um, I found another great piece of advice was every time that like, you prepare something, you think about actually going into it and accessing it as a child and yeah. just things like written instructions are so challenging for children. Mm. And especially on a timetable, like we, we post similar timetables every day and we do, we obviously change the text, but a child won't read all of the text consistently mm. um, and they'll spot it, they'll think it looks the same and then they'll just end up on a completely different platform by accident yeah. or they'll miss the video mm. and it's, you, think that they'll, you think they'll read it and to be, I think I'm guilty of that as well as an adult. Like you, you just, it becomes familiar so it's just mm. ensuring that children do try and do that and we've started trying to introduce things like... Um, sessions in the morning like live sessions where we talk through the timetable just because it breaks it down for the children mm. a little bit more and also they get to see each other mm. I think when this started everything was about um very much like making sure the children don't miss out on any of the education mm. and making sure that like maths and English and all of those subjects are consistent um but now it's become for us more about the children being able to see each other and not miss out on every all those social skills that they'd be gaining at school so for us it's like moving forward how can we continue to sort of 
um, bring the children together. Mm-hmm. So we found like quite a lot of success recently in just doing, we're doing, we're actually doing like live sessions, mm-hmm. which is, I know quite a lot of schools aren't, but, um, because, and we're doing focused weeks. So like this week's been arts week and we just doing sessions with the children all together and doing things like live drawing and we'll just share a screen and they all draw together. And it's really nice because they just comment and share on share their work and talk about each other's and I think that's really nice um I've also noticed that I think children's like confidence is increasing because they've they've got the ability to yeah actually take something and share it and everyone can see it and also written feedback when you're giving the feedback to children they can go back to it and I think that sometimes becomes lost in books they don't always go back to it so I think it's really powerful for that as well and yeah I've certainly found some successes in that I do agree that engagement you can just it's like dependent on the weather and many other things um and then i guess it's just about how we're trying to be forward thinking in order to kind of continue to captivate children's engagement that's the main thing and utilizing all of like the brilliant resources out there um because that's really like the best way i found to engage the children just to target what they're interested in and that's what we do every day in school but like continue just to go with that I think that's really interesting as well, because um, there seems to be some schools that weren't used to using technology for education. They almost sent the work out that it was for a supply teacher, because that's how you set a lesson up to be covered. So it was very worded for another grown up who would understand how a lesson would be structured. And actually, there's been... I think, a change in how education sees that learning. Um, One without the huge socialisations of classes of 30 um, and actually what the dynamic of having one-on-one with the parents at home, um, how you bring those sort of socialisation factors back into education for the the students accessing this and actually how um, educators, we are learning as we go along with this. You know, this is an unprecedented situation. Um, And I know... From my experience with the EdTech Demo uh, programme, that school leaders are at different points on that journey. Um, um, I'd like to, uh, I feel like I don't need to introduce you, Katie. I feel that everyone should know you. Um, (laughs) But would would you mind introducing yourself? Sorry, I'm late. I was on another uh, call. My name's Katie Potts. I support um, Islington Schools and Beyond with uh, traditionally digital and online safety. I've kind of, my expertise has been with um, parents and families. So that's kind of key, has always been a key strand of my work. And I've always done, um, supported our schools running uh, digital and sessions with families about how to effectively use technology rather than just the safeguarding and online safety message. You know, I've always had a model for, for, for 20 years. I've worked with these instant schools, um, collect, you know, sharing good practice across of our schools. So very early on, Hanover, Paul and his head teacher, Jackson, were very supportive. We collaborated back in March. Um, Uh, with uh, all of our schools in terms of collating the practice that we were developing and then supporting training um, for other schools that were were coming on. Picking up from Pip, who's gone, Pip is a school at King's Cross, so it's actually a Camden school, um, but his head teacher uh, was at Thornhill previously, which is another Islington school, and he he was one of the few head, head teachers years ago that made the managed learning environment work, used front of back in 2010, and uh, used it really, really effectively. It was one of our lead schools. So we we adopted kind of some of the themes was around connect, motivate, and celebrate. So kind of connecting families uh, to their school and to their children. Um, motivating has been really, really key across all social economic groups. You've got working families, you've got furloughed families, you've got hard to reach families. But irrespective, all children and parents um, and carers need to be motivated. So we wanted to connect. We wanted to motivate. And then what Pip said is we wanted to celebrate. So we wanted to give people an audience and exactly what Pip said. Um, if children know that they have an audience, that their, their work is, is, their work is, sorry, that's a doorbell. You can't ever filter out doorbells. If we can, um, you know, if children know that their work is going to be shared, exactly what Pip said, you know, that that's going to galvanise them, going to energise them, going to motivate them to share, to share that. Um, I've worked, we've worked really closely with leadership. This is all about leadership. Can't under understate how how it, critical that this is driven by head teacher and his governors, and that's that's absolutely key. Um, it's the same with all of our effective schools, really, and it's the tools that they use. You know, it's the monitoring that's absolutely crucial. You know, very often you'll hear to the school say, "Oh yeah, I'm using Google." It's like, mm. show me the evidence. 
how you use it, what percentage you use it, what time do they use it, and um, where's you know what what's the work that's coming back, what's the feedback that's coming back, and oh yeah, actually we're just using Google for file management, or oh, some children have used it in year six, or or we've used you know we, we've used it with uh, you know phase leaders, etc. So you really need to get the devil is in the detail, and we you know sharing you know lead schools. You know, they're, they're monitoring tools, you know, their schools like King's Cross are monitor on a daily basis, which children are logging on and where, which families need support. And they did that right from the start and they modified PIP as Hanover have, have had journeys in how they've developed their home learning content and delivery. So um, that, that's absolutely key. And then, as you say, how are we going to move on with developing a strategy? We have got um, a series of... Uh, cross borough leadership training sessions now with head teachers and governors where we're sharing good practice and we're moving into our digital strategy ready for September you know the, the you know the flip learning and the benefits of flip learning which people like me I've been doing my job for 20 years and it's like you know we've been talking about flip learning for 20 years so now we've we've been pushed into because of this crisis we've been pushed into using it and now how are we going to embed flip learning effectively because you hear stories like Paul talked about Pippa's talked about actually how children have benefited from this and children who, you know, King's Cross is sharing a story last week with us where a child who has, has exceeded during home learning. Every school um, has those stories, really, that, you know, children and staff actually have, you know, flourished um, during this new way of learning. And so how do we take those positives on? However, but at the same time, you know, my, I've just come off a safeguarding call you know, we've had some really, really serious, um, you know, not surprising uh, cases of safeguarding incidents, online safeguarding that, you know, actually probably have been watered down because the priority has been around primary food poverty, domestic violence, mm. but actually bubbling away have been the, the online and the safeguarding incidents that now are going to come back and be, you know, we're going to have a spike in, in referrals when things uh, settle down. So it's how we you know, have a digital strategy that embeds safeguard and it embeds inclusion, um, it, inc it embeds SEN, um, uh, and it has effective CPD for staff. You know, sometimes we've got schools that are doing brilliant home learning online. Actually, where's the effective supervision online for their staff? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not their fault, it's just because that we did this in an emergency. So that digital strategy is absolutely key um, for, for leadership and, and gender, you know, I met you, Nick, through di gender conversations. I think we've had a digital divide crisis. We've had a gender divide crisis in this, um, cri you know, this uh, COVID crisis. There's been lots of narrative in the press around going back to the 1950s. Yeah. And I think um, it's true for many families. You know, men's jobs are designed um in certain ways it feels and women's and there's just consistent narrative and reports now uh, coming through uh, around that and uh, you know that's not a great model is it for families that actually it's mummy that does the work with you at home we've, we've taken some steps back not just with the digital divide but the you know gender divide so that all needs to be addressed so there you go some messages from Islington head teachers uh, to kick start the conversation Love it, love it, love it. And I think there's, yeah, there is a mixture. I mean, there was a report that came up that, um, around men's childcare and that's increased. But I think it's interesting in our sector as well. Becky, who I'm about to bring in as well, uh, we were part of the Broadcast EdTech Festival that's been going on. They're one of the demonstrator schools the last two days. I mean, brilliant take up, 1,600 participants, um, hundreds of, uh, you know, of sessions that they put on. Um, and and what I was really pleased to see that there were more women um, uh, um, speaking, teachers sharing what they're doing. Still feel the representation in terms of BAME and EdTech isn't where it needs to be yet. But I was pleased to see that that things are, are starting to move in the di right direction. So Becky and I only I think it was only yesterday we spoke as well, which is just a privilege. But Becky Bow, would you like to introduce yourself? And also Becky's. Um, uh, far yonder uh, in Wales which obviously had a national approach before Covid so Becky it'd be really interesting to hear your reflections on what you've heard as well. Yeah great um, yeah hi so uh, first of all just to let you know I'm actually in work at the moment so if the radio goes um, we've got certain <laughs> 
codes, which might mean I have to just drop everything and go Not if there's an emergency. Problem. But it's year seven in today, so we should be all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Becky Baller and I'm the lead teacher for ICT and the digital strategy at my school in South Wales. We're just sort of about 10 miles away from Newport. Um, I've also done some work with the local authority and the consortium um, around digital and training staff and students. Um, and I think, you know, the big thing for us in Wales is we had a national platform. We had Hub. It's been around quite a long time. Um, it started off, if I'm honest, people weren't fans. Um, it had a, um, a virtual learning environment linked to it uh, called Hub Plus, which the primary schools liked, the secondary schools did not because a lot of them had Moodle platforms and things. So it was not the best start. Um, but Hub very quickly within the first couple of years realized that the Hub Plus bit wasn't working, got rid of it and have made some deals with Microsoft and Google. So you go onto Hub now, every child in Wales from the age of, I think it's four up to 19 has a Hub login. Um, every teacher has a hub login, every teaching assistant, every member of admin staff. Basically, if you're on our um, management system as being a member of staff, you have a hub login. Local authorities have it as well. And when you log into it, you have access to the full Office 365 suite and the full G Suite for education and came on board uh, about four or five weeks ago now. We've also got Adobe Spark platform on there and we've got Flipgrid and the J2E platform. So these are national. Um, they are completely free then and students and teachers can also download Office 365 onto their personal devices. So we had a strategy. We had digital at the front. We had the digital mm. competence framework, um, which outlined the progression steps that children need to have from, you know, foundation phase at age four up to post 16. You know, those things, and it looked at citizenship, it looked at being consumers and producers, mm. um, it looked at data and computational thinking. So all that was there already. So we did have that sort of handle on it. We also had a commitment for broadband across the valleys and the rural areas. It hadn't all rolled out, but there was the commitment and a passion for digital among the Welsh government. Um, but it has still brought up this massive, um, digital divide. Yep. It's brought up a huge difference between the haves and the haves not. Mm. And thinking about one of um, Caroline keeps the phrases, you know, the, the low tech and the no tech. You know, we've got families who are reasonably well off families in our school who have one laptop mm. in the house. Yeah. Now that's not an issue, mm. but it is an issue when mum's at home, dad's at home, sisters at home, and you're at home, yep. and you've got work to do. Yeah. And all of a sudden accessing google on your phone isn't fine because there's videos to watch and there's activities to do yeah. and there's links and you're running out of data mm. and you know where are you going to work Absolutely. so you know we had a commitment from welsh government to send out devices mm. um some authorities have already done that some authorities are still going through the process because they had to get the devices first sure. configure them send them out um so there's a big discrepancy there. We've got students who didn't realise that they could ask for them. So I've got students in today, uh, year seven or in today. We've got students today who haven't been accessing the work because they didn't know that if they contacted us, we'd have given them a device. See, and, just, and that kind you know, of knowledge as well, Becky, as well, with students not knowing, families not knowing, mm. it's, it is kind of hard to know where to start. Gina, can I come over to you now? Because I know you've done a lot of work around this as well. Yeah, sure. So... Um, Obviously, COVID-19 has forced everyone to think outside the box, <laughs> and we're no different here at Education Technology. I'm obviously coming, coming at this from a different perspective as, as most of the other people um, chatting here, because you guys are you know, mostly teachers, whereas I'm obviously an editor, so writing about the situation going on. Um, so one thing we did, you know, that, that whole thinking outside the box to, I guess, stay afloat and think long term about how we can adapt to the situation. Um, we uh, joined the virtual conference realm um, 
the ad tech sofa sessions is uh, what we called it so it's six hours of live panel discussions about remote learning the digital divide all the things sort of happening now mm. and as part of that we conducted a survey um it was called COVID-19 how the pandemic is affecting teaching that we promoted across all of our platforms and got some really interesting results from teachers who are on the front line we had 38 percent uh, of respondents saying that they've been lumped with considerably more work since the start now safeguarding obviously falls under that because it's um, had to adapt along with everything else we had a further 20 percent saying that they had been totally overloaded with work and you can obviously imagine when the teacher crisis a thing that existed pre-covid how this might affect that long term so you know it's it's done big things for their stress levels um only 15 percent said their workload had been unaffected and eight percent actually said that they hadn't been working at all so you can imagine though they're not bearing the same work induced stresses that they are also then bearing the stress of their livelihood (laughs) like am i gonna have a job to return to once this is all over and then interestingly um, we obviously then asked them about their students workload Um, I know we've touched on engagement already in the conversation Um, and 50% of teachers said that their students have actually been completing more work Um, 29% said that it hasn't changed and 21% said their students have been less work and from a personal perspective for me I found that really interesting because I would have assumed that they would that there wouldn't be such a big difference between those doing more and less work. And I actually would have assumed that students would be doing less mm. because of the impact on focus and therefore productivity. Mm. So I think that's, it kind of always seems weird saying, you know, that's one positive of the mm. situation yeah. we find ourselves in. But that's, that was one thing I, I found interesting because I thought, you know if they've been completing more work because this mean that students really are engaging well with this influx of technology yeah and I think the positive side is something uh, we could maybe sort of close this on as well because um I know for my send child who actually feels much more comfortable at home has really engaged with work and is is actually learning a lot more around this um uh we're able to do projects with with the children you know a teacher that I was so um just going forward it would be really nice just to hear from everyone um in the gang here what um sort of advice would you say going forwards in a kind of positive way what what have your been your big wins um so we'll go around um Paul would you like to start what would you sort of advise as something that could help going forwards well I think I think there's been actually a surprising amount of positives um from this um which is obviously a difficult thing to say in the same sort of phrase you know the same sentence as a global pandemic but we have learned so much and uh, one thing we've done throughout this process is seek feedback uh, not just from parents which we've done all along the way the process um, to make sure that we're providing um, content which uh, which is, is works for their context um, but also to teachers and we've, we've, we've produced a learning from lockdown google form um, which we are collating the data and trying to use that to formulate a uh, a new normal for September um, because uh, there are many things that we've learned um, and wh- what, what this has enabled us to do is be very flexible in the way that we deliver content obviously all the kinds of pressures which exist in a normal school environment um, don't exist but there are different pressures uh, the pressures of making sure that we're we're, uh, we're providing something where children um, can continue to learn uh, remotely and it's interesting that the things that you've been saying about uh, SEN children our ASC children have been thriving uh, in mm-hmm. terms of producing work and focus that's that's what we're finding more than anything and children who who produce very little in a in an overstimulating environment with you know 29 of the children they are uh, submitting work that we've never seen before so we've got to learn from that and um you know we 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 do have a huge issue um, with the tech, the, the, the fight for device at home, which, is, which has meant that many of our most vulnerable children may not have engaged in any kind of sort of formal learning at all over these few months. So we need to make sure that we, we address that. And I mean, we're now thinking more uh, deeply about trauma and um, 
we react differently to those children who've had trauma or we adapt to the way that we communicate and we just have a more empathetic, you know, we have an, an approach which understands that the whole child, this is now part of that experience of the child and we've, we've, we've got to sort of, uh, you know, use that to differentiate our approach um, to teaching them, uh, to teaching the children in September. And that's obviously, we don't know what it's going to what it's going to be like in September, but we do need a contingency plan which doesn't sort of, um, you know, hothouse or, or pressurise the children into catching up, but but really sort of focuses on that reconnection and that love of school and that love of learning. And it, it's just sort of holding all these up, this um, reflecting uh, on, on what could happen and, and the, the, the different experiences the children have had at home in these four months or six months it will be, won't it? Yeah, and I, I mean, it kind of leads me to an interesting point because I, I think I've got really mixed feelings about it. The idea that, you know, we're kind of behind and some kids are, you know, you know, really need to catch up on it. And there's a little bit, I think, well, it is inconsistent. We know it's inconsistent, but we also know we, you know, the nation's been through this global crisis and actually, you know, people are dying and yet we're going, oh, no, but, you know, they haven't done this in this subject. And actually, it's that kind of balance. And I do wonder, I do have faith in, in, in teachers. And I do think, do you know what, They'll, the kids will come back in September and teachers will try and bring those classes back up to speed. But it is very much a personal journey for the kids. And are we being too hard on, on ourselves as, as educators by going, oh my God, you know, we've, we really need to get every kid back to where they were. They've missed all this valuable time. Or do we say, do you know, you know, they were safe, you know, they could be deaths in a the family. They've been through an awful, that trauma that you're saying about, you know, parents might have lost work, you know, um, and actually we'll just get back in. We'll get the kids slowly transitioned in. And, you know, there might be another lockdown. This, this situation might not just disappear. And, and actually all we can do is, is what we can do. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? I totally agree. I think it's, um, we, we, I mean, lockdown, not just in the education sector, but I think everybody obviously has had different experiences. But I think a lot of people have sort of started to focus on what really matters in life, where they actually get joy in life, what, 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 how much you actually need. Um, and without getting too sort of deep, I think, when the children come back, I know that my focus will be on exposing the children to the most the quality texts, you know, all the things that they may not have experienced in this time, the things that I love to enjoy with my family, and I know really is more important than a number or a grade in at the end of year six. And, you know, if, you, if you're not happy, if you're not comfortable, if you don't have those hierarchy of needs met in the classroom, you can't learn. So we've got to mm. focus on that first. That is our priority. And that transition back into the classroom, Kate, I'd be interested to see what, what you're thinking with, with your settings, because, you know, I know my children um, will find it hard to kind of leave home and, and be back in an educational experience. Um, I've got four year old twins that are about to start school, so they, there would be a transition built into it. But there won't be for my older child going back. There'll be a kind of there's an implication from the school that we really miss them. We want the kids back full time. We want them here. But actually, the ch- some, for some children, uh, particularly some of the SEND children, I think there needs to be a kind of transition built in as well. What are your thoughts on that, Katie? I mean, I think the, there's research coming through at the moment around um, SEND and um, the impact on families. And some of it is quite um, you know, concerning you know, some of the um, wraparound services that um, families of send children traditionally receive hasn't been able to be delivered. Um, so last week there was some um, quite heart-hitting um, reports coming through just around how traumatic this has been um, for some families. Um, and just actually the, the crisis has made society realise what schools, what the role schools actually play, you know, in terms of, being the crux of many children's and families' life, really. We saw that with free school. I've just come off a call where one local authority has said they've got children who are not coming back into school because actually the free school meal vouchers of £15 is, is you know, so important to that, you know, that family. So for, 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 for send families and for vulnerable families, I think, we, you know, there's going to be more research coming through and I think we need more research. It's really fantastic to hear Paul um, Hanover Primary in, in Angel is, is, you know, has, I've seen the head teacher shared with me, um, you know, really rigorous 
reporting from their families about that experience. But I think we need more of that. There was this small report, you know, a few hundred people on the BBC today, mm. you know, just talking about how traumatic this experience has been for some, some families. And actually home learning has not been fun at all. So, the, the, you know, there might be some children who have, have flourished but for many families, managing when you're working um, or you've got a small environment, you haven't got enough technology. Managing the home learning has been has has been has been difficult. So I just don't think I think the research is coming through at the moment, um, uh, and I think there's not there's not enough of it. Though there's been a complete um, nose diving referrals across all safeguarding. Um, I'm I'm particularly working online safety. There's been a complete nose dives in those. You know, the Safer Internet Centre reported almost no safeguarding online safeguarding reports. Where typically I'm feeding in five a week from his intern. I've made I've, in, I've encouraged all of our schools to incorporate online safety into their weekly phone calls. Phone calls have been important to families mm. um, and hard to reach families. You know, we talk about online learning and mm. Google and you know Seesaw and Class Dojo, but actually sometimes that phone call has been absolute a lifeline especially when people are so sort of zoomed out with it all as well yeah absolutely and, I, and, and it's a personal been, touch isn't it i think the yeah exactly we've been putting narrative in nudging families to say look what about how your children coping with online and actually they're like it's almost unconscious it's primary concern has been food and you know domestic violence and other headlines and so these secondary concerns are actually in normal day-to-day school life, we will be flagging as really serious safeguarding, have become secondary. And definitely in the narrative of across parent lockdown groups that I'm on, it, you know, it's just gone through the roof. It's like, actually, my kids usually don't game in the week on a school night. Now they're having two or three hours. My, certainly in my household, you know, I've got a year four child. He's not allowed on fortnight because, you know, it's 12 and over, but all of his friends have been on it. They've been able to socialise, you know, my poor nine-year-old hasn't been allowed on it, but I've stuck firm, tough love, you know, so he's actually missed out, you know, on that. However, there's really serious cases coming through. The Money Programme on on Saturday reported um, around loot boxes and a a pandemic of kids, you know, kind of online gambling during this time where families don't realise that the kids are buying online. That's just one area. And then, of course, child abuse, predators, uh, we've certainly dealt with some very, very serious incidents. So, yeah, it, it's just a lot is going to come through. You asked about send. We don't know a lot yet, do we? Yeah, um, and I think that, um, it, you know, in lieu of the research, I think it is this situation has really made us think about our interconnectedness in lots of different ways. And those, um, again, what would be happening, which have been amplified with this, and those family situations would be that engagement with school would be the same. But Actually, I think, you know, like as a profession, we can also see how engaged those people would be normally. This is this is just illustrated it more because that those the children are in the classrooms, but those things are going on anyway. So I think there's, yeah. there's big learners about it. I, absolutely. I mean, I think some of the providers, I really hope I've been pushing for the BBC Bite Size and for Oak Academy and others. At the moment, the DfE are always, I mean, you know, but this is often disjointed, but we've got the you know, DfE pushing the online strategy the learning we need to thread through, you know, health and well-being in all of the messages, and that's not happening at the moment. So, you know, obesity has definitely gone through the roof. I can, I live in Fringy Park, I know loads of the kids in an area, lots of children um, who I know on the peripheral in our neighbourhood who live in small flats. All their families are saying they've put on weight. You know, I've put everyone's put on weight. We've been sedentary. We've been having, we've had a a huge increase in our time online and we're not moving around as much mm. so those kind of really important that's why you know hats off to joe wicks because he is a motivational machine and there was lots of moaning in the education world about he should be a PE teacher. actually no we need a motivational god and he is a motivational god he got everyone across social economic groups moving um, in small spaces and that was really, really important. So, you know, there's a there's a whole raft of, you know, online safety, health and well-being issues for SEND and for everyone. And we need, at this point, all of us, if, you, if you're talking to any of these people, I certainly am trying to, let's get, because we're going to hit another period. Now, we've got the whole summer period where usually we push out digital fibre day, the Children's Commissioner, but there's normally a huge concern on the 18th of July around these children being online much more. But actually, you know, what can we can we just thread through some of those safeguarding issues now um, through the main platforms that we're using with with families? Because it's not 
that's not happening at the moment actually Absolutely. Um, so what I'd like to do, just as we sort of round this up a little bit, talking about motivating, Becky, I know you've got to go soon. What advice would you give to settings um, in lieu of a September looming before us? Well, I think from, from my point of view, you know, the most important thing is, you know, we're, we're planning for what we don't know. Um, I would like to see planning for a blended approach where we've got the online but we're also planning in terms of the logistics of that. So making sure our students have the access. We're also planning, I think, for um, parents to have some kind of support from us. You know, this is what online looks like. Um, and that schools are planning for blended that can then convert into the classroom rather than classroom that then converts into blended. Because I think it's easier to go, you know, that way round. If you plan for the classroom and then you're online, what you'll end up with, I think, is what we've had at the very beginning of all of this, which was that mass dumping of PDFs and worksheets onto a platform and hoping for the best and, you know, just sort of winging it a little bit. Like you mentioned with that idea of it being sort of cover work. Whereas if we plan for it being online, actually, then what will happen is we're thinking a bit more about what a blended approach is. So where do the live sessions come in? What do we do in the face-to-face time? Do we just spend time going through how to go online? Well, no, let's use the face-to-face time. What do we give in addition to um, online learning? You know, do we get some textbooks? Do we print some booklets? Do we send things home? So they've got a big mixture of real blended approach. And then we've just done a staff survey. We're in the middle of it now. You know, what staff training? Mm. you know because staff are all confident with certain things but as time goes on they've seen what other schools are doing and they're like Mm. well actually I quite like to do that how do I do it so what training do I need to put in place in my role Mm. to support my staff taking the next step are you doing that training for staff now because I know some settings are doing a training before the summer holidays and then yeah we're starting it now um Mm. yeah Monday I'm doing a one hour session on using live events on teams Mm. um to introduce live sessions we've been a a group of about six of us have been piloting it for a couple of weeks with digital leaders just getting the ins and outs so we actually have a real sense of what it's going to look like for us and the safe way of doing it um but I think the the other big thing is not to keep assuming that our children are digital natives because they're not they're consumers (laughs) they're users of technology they don't know how to produce they don't know how to manage things they don't know how their files work they've got the confidence but that's because you know I'm of a generation where we had one BBC computer shared between Mm. two classrooms and when I went to secondary school we had a a lovely Nimbus network and the IT teacher used to walk in and go take your paws off my computers (laughs) and it was completely you know Mm. we've got that fear you know my generation got that slight slight awe of the computer the younger generation haven't got the fear but they actually are consumers yeah. they don't know the ins and outs of it they don't know how to you know, simple things like not naming files mm. you know the number of untitled documents that i get sent through is just unbelievable it's that lack so of responsibility about, isn't it that they yeah. still have which is you know yeah they're, kids. they're plug and play aren't they they're not digital they natives they're a plug and play generation mm. And I think for me, there's a huge thing. So there's a bit of staff work to be done. There's work done with parents, definitely. There's work done with um, the students to actually, and then fundamentally, it's making a blended approach that includes everything that isn't just about going back, Mm. opening the laptop in September, logging on and looking at a PDF, because that's not going to get anyone anywhere in the end. No, absolutely. Thank you, Becky. Gina, what would you say is um, advice moving forward as well? Well, I think um, I, I would agree with what Becky was saying there, as in we need to continue refining um, digital provision in every sense, because uh, no matter how we're returning to this new normal or whatever anyone wants to call it, that could change at the drop of a hat as it did initially. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. But one of the biggest things I would say is support for teachers. Mm. Um uh, we've spoken a lot, and again, I couldn't agree more about the, the issues for students, but teachers also are struggling and yeah. need support. We've got lots of interesting results from our survey, but some of actually the most interesting was the qualitative, res- qualitative results, that's a mouthful, that we got yeah. back. And some of them, honestly, made me a bit emotional reading them, because obviously they're kind of filled in anonymously, 
um, people, and, and I guess we, we put the survey out at the height of stress uh, mm. when everyone was adapting. So one, one lecturer um, said, I'm shocked at the assumption that we will sacrifice our own mental and physical health for our students automatically. We are expected to constantly support them, but no one is really supporting us. And then another assistant professor, um, not UK based, but obviously, you know, similar situations happening in the context of my country where less than 40 percent of the students are able to attend online classes. As a teacher, I cannot do much to help them. And you cannot shake the feeling of being useless and irrelevant. And when you think of the pressure that they're already bearing mm. on top of this <laughs> and you know, the very nature of teachers, you think, is that they are obviously going to prioritise their students in most cases, but not that they should, because they have to be at their best, you know, to, to have the, the impact that they should be having on these students. So so I just think that, yeah, we, we can't overlook and, and push the, the teacher's health aside because it's really important. Brilliant. OK, that's really good. So there's lots of points there looking forward. And I think, you know, this is a difficult time. There's, you know, we've talked a lot about the tensions, the frustrations, um, the gulfs, the gaps um, and how difficult it has been. And um, but also I think there has been a mixture of what we've learned seems to have come through really clearly. And, and um, it's that pick and mix for settings. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of being part of the EdTech Demonstrator programme because it's allowing schools that have silly questions, who did not prepare for this, who still don't know what they're doing in week 11 of it, that they can speak to another school that's got is a little bit further on their journey, who are still making mistakes, still learning, but they can have those, those you know, mentoring and those coaching and those supportive calls with someone who's going through the same situation as them because, I, yeah, that is something that our sector does seem to need and it hasn't been built into this and I think um, the people here are absolutely right in saying that that's something that people can look forward to in September and and need to build in they need to be aware of it name it and then do something about it. Strategy wise we have to empower the middle managers and middle leaders as well in schools you know so we're, we're doing a digital strategy work with all of our schools at the moment and working with all of the subject leaders with the SEN coordinators with the um, you know, extended school provision. So just working with everyone's development plans at the moment about how how the digital platforms can be can be used is really really important. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think we'll we'll finish off there. So thanks everyone for being involved. And thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Paul, Thank thanks you so much. much. Thanks for coming thanks from Hanover. You. Brilliant Pleasure. seeing you. you great Thank work, you. Paul. No, it's really exciting um, what could lie ahead. But thank you very much to. Good yeah, it's been fabulous, your work. Thanks for feeding everything back. Bye now. Thanks Thank a lot, guys. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye. Thank you. Cheers, Bye Jenna. Now. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Katie. Legend. There you go, Safe. Hope it was all right. Take care, mate. Thanks for listening in, everyone. If you like this episode, as I mentioned before, please rate and review wherever you get your podcast from. And what else? If you want to share your message, why not place an ad in our upcoming episodes? Drop us an email at the edtechpodcast at gmail.com. But otherwise, that's it for this week. Stay busy, stay safe, and keep smiling. Bye-bye.